Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Lemonade Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. Thank you. And I'd like to hand the conference over to your presenters. Lemonade Management Team, please go ahead. Good morning and welcome to Lemonade's second quarter 2020 earnings call. My name is Yael Wisner Levy and I am the VP Communications at Lemonade. Joining me today to discuss our results are Daniel Schreiber, CEO and co founder, Shai Winninger, COO and co founder, and Tim Bixby, Lemonade's CFO. A letter to shareholders covering the company's second quarter 2020 financial results is available on our investor relations website at investor.lemonade.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that management's remarks on this call may contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Actual results may differ materially from those indicated by those forward-looking statements as a result of various important factors including those discussed in the risk factors section of our Form 10-Q for the three months ended June 30, 2020, and other filings with the SEC. Any forward-looking statements made on this call represent our views only as of today, and we undertake no obligation to update them. We will be referring to certain non-GAAP financial measures on today's call, such as adjusted EBITDA and adjusted gross profit which we believe may be important to investors to assess our operating performance. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are included in our letter to shareholders. Our letter to shareholders also includes information about our key operating metrics, including a def definition of each metric, why each is useful to investors, and how we each use to monitor and manage our business. We have also prepared a visual presentation that investors can consult to follow along with this discussion, and it can be accessed at investor.lemonade.com. With that, I'll turn the call over to Daniel, who will begin with a few opening remarks. Daniel? Thank you, Yael. Good morning. I'd like to welcome our shareholders, longstanding, newly minted, and prospective to this inaugural earnings call of Lemonade. Since this is my first time talking to many of you, I'm going to take a few minutes to provide some context for the strong second quarter results, which Tim will expand on shortly. Lemonade was founded as a new kind of insurance company, one built from scratch on an unconflicted business model and an entirely digital substrate. We set out to replace brokers and bureaucracy with bots and machine learning, aiming for zero paperwork and instant everything. Our hypothesis was that by placing the consumer at the center and building the policy, the technology, and the business model around her, we'd achieve a level of customer satisfaction unknown in the sector. Thankfully, this is largely how things played out. Our net promoter score stands at above 70, a level of customer delight usually reserved for brands like Apple or Tesla. And consumers have upvoted Lemonade to the number one position on many of their destinations where Americans review their insurance company. Perhaps that's less surprising when you consider that the median time to buy a policy from Lemonade is about 90 seconds. Roughly a third of our claims are paid instantaneously, and first-time buyers of insurance can often save 50% by choosing Lemonade. This level of service and automation has generated very rapid growth, and increasing efficiencies trends captured well in our second quarter numbers. Our top line, in-force premium, increased 115% year-on-year, while our adjusted gross profit grew by over 200% year-on-year. Rapid growth is always welcome, but in our case, it does double duty. In addition to boosting our top and bottom lines, it generates troves of textured, proprietary, and highly predictive data. Insurance is the business of using data to quantify risk, and a digital substrate allows us to capture something like a hundredfold more data than traditional broker-based incumbents. We believe that represents a structural and growing competitive advantage. These data serve as training sets for all of our systems, fueling a cycle of continuous improvement. 
With every turn of the flywheel, our marketing campaigns become more effective. Our bots get better at understanding our customers' needs. Our fraud detection picks up ever fainter signals, and our claims bot, Jim, learns which claims to pay and which to escalate with growing precision. <clears throat> All this amounts to a powerful closed-loop system, allowing us to target price and underwrite risk with growing accuracy, which is the very core of insurance. The impact of this continuous learning is on display in our second quarter results too, and is best captured by a gross loss ratio, which was 67% for the quarter. This represents our 10th consecutive quarter of declining loss ratios, and our loss ratio has halved over the past two years. This rate of improvement in loss ratio is, to the best of my knowledge, without precedent in the history of the insurance industry and is all the more unusual for coming at a time of very rapid growth. While our strategy is to delight consumers in order to grow their number and to leverage that growth to extend our data advantage, we also aim to grow with our customers. This has been in evidence in the steady growing percentage of homeowners who started life with us as renters, a trend that continued unabated in the second quarter. In July, we launched health insurance for pets, our first major offering outside of the world of homeowners insurance, and a milestone on our journey to offer a comprehensive solution to our customers with potentially far-reaching implications for customer retention and lifetime value. Shai will share some early thoughts and numbers on our pet launch in a couple of minutes. In many ways, then, our second quarter was a straight-line continuation of the progressions we've seen in recent quarters and years rapid top-line growth, increasing efficiency, declining loss ratios. But it would be a mistake to take the second quarter results as pedestrian or a foregone conclusion because early in the quarter, we anticipated things playing out very differently. With millions furloughed and much of humanity in lockdown, in the early days of the quarter, we resolved to cut our discretionary spending, pause our non-essential hiring, and enable customers to postpone their payments to us in recognition of the widespread hardship COVID-19 had engendered. We braced for a spike in churn, a drop in demand, a slowdown in productivity, and a hit to our cash flow. Thankfully, none of these materialized. Despite our marketing pullback and notwithstanding the shutdown at all of our offices, our key performance indicators for Q2 outperformed not only our worst concerns, but even our pre-pandemic aspirations. No one knows what turn the pandemic or the economy will take in Q3 or beyond, but we're heartened by the resilience our team, our company, and our business demonstrated in the second quarter. Indeed, the coronavirus seems to have been a fundamental accelerator of the trend towards digitization throughout society, and Lemonade is thankfully on the right side of that dislocation. Our IPO prospectus includes our founder's letter, a document where Shai and I outline our approach to managing Lemonade in the hope that investors who share our thinking will be drawn to Lemonade, but equally in the hope that those who do not will seek their fortunes elsewhere. There's a link to this letter on the homepage of our investor relations website, and I warmly recommend you read it. One of the points we make there is that we view our plans as hypotheses to be updated as data accumulate. Our plan is to adapt. Q2 demonstrated this in spades. As I mentioned, faced with unprecedented uncertainty, early in the quarter we decided to decelerate our marketing spend meaningfully, and we prepared for our growth to take a disproportionate hit. We then monitored signals from the market in real time, click-through rates, funnel analysis, retention numbers, cost per click, and many more, and adapted to the encouraging signals as these came in. The quarter had a happy ending, but it's important for me to share how that sausage was made, because it's illustrative of how we think and how we operate. We endeavor to be driven by data, but data are often incomplete. And while waiting for more data decreases error rates, it also blunts potential upside. As Q2 demonstrated, we prefer to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty and to abandon bad ones as soon as the data reveals them to be so. We believe that translates into greater volatility, but also into better aggregate returns. It's a trade between the short term and the long term, between optimizing for predictability versus optimizing for value maximization. It's a trade we're comfortable making, and as our shareholders, we do hope you are comfortable with the way we're making it too. 
And with that, let me hand over to Shai to give you some more updates. Shai. Thanks, Daniel. Daniel spoke about the financial impact or lack of financial impact of the pandemic on our business. I'd like to add some color from the operations perspective where I'm pleased to report that things are in good shape. In early March, the entire Lemonade team started working from home. Since Lemonade is based on cloud infrastructure, our team switched to this new arrangement overnight and with no interruption to our business activities. If anything, we're seeing productivity improvement across the organization, and for the first time, we actually launched a new European country as well as a new product line from home. We've also been able to recruit and onboard new team members throughout the company. In fact, at this point, over a quarter of our team were recruited and onboarded remotely during the pandemic. We invest a lot of thought and effort into keeping the team engaged and happy at home. And our employee satisfaction rates, which we constantly measure, are the highest we've ever seen. Switching gears to pet insurance. As Daniel mentioned, the release of the pet health insurance line earlier this quarter is a significant milestone for the company. We built the pet product entirely from scratch, rethinking coverages, user experience, the claims process, pricing, and even the policy document itself. Our pet product offers a hassle-free digital experience with lightning fast claim payments, best-in-class customer service, and a donation of leftover premium to animal-focused charities our customers choose. The new pet insurance is now available in more than 30 states, with prices starting at $10 per month. As part of this new release, we've also introduced our first lemonade bundle, allowing an additional 10% savings when bundling pet insurance with one of our renters or homeowners policies. I'm pleased to share that the reception has been positive and the feedback we're getting from customers translates into a net promoter score of well over 80. But as encouraged as we are by the initial results, it's important to remember that introducing a new insurance product to the market takes time and that we're still in the early days of this process. In other news, on August 6th, we announced our annual giveback in which a portion of underwriting profits go to charities that our customers choose. As the Lemonade community grows, so does the potential of the giveback. And this year's donation amounted to more than 20x the first one we gave back in 2017, and is higher than our previous three years combined. This year, we gave back more than $1 million to nonprofit organizations, including the Direct Relief COVID Response, UNICEF, the Trevor Project, and the ACLU. With the help of our community, we funded treatments for more than 50,000 ICU COVID patients fed 980 families, covered rent for more than 100 struggling households, and more. Giveback Day is one of the highlights of the year for our team, and we do hope that as shareholders, you too will feel a certain pride of ownership in this day. And now, let me hand over to Tim for a bit more detail around our financial results and outlook. Tim? Great. Thanks, Shai. I'll give a bit more color on our Q2 results, as well as expectations for the rest of 2020, and then we'll turn to questions. We had another strong quarter of growth, driven by additions of new customers, as well as continued increase in premium per customer. Inforce premium grew 115% as compared to the prior year, to $155.1 million. This metric captures the full scope of our top-line growth before the impact of reinsurance, and regardless of the timing of customer acquisition during the quarter. Premium per customer increased 17% versus the prior year to $190. This increase was driven by a combination of increased value of policies over time, as well as mixed shift toward higher value homeowner policies. Gross earned premium in Q2 increased 121% as compared to the prior year to $35.3 million, in line with the increase in enforced premium. Our gross loss ratio continued to improve, as it has for many quarters, and came in at 67% for Q2, as compared to 72% in the first quarter of this year, and down from 82% in the second quarter of 2019. With a Q2 gross loss ratio in the 60s, I'm pleased to note that we are now within our target range, 
an achievement we've been focused on since selling our first policy. We expect that our gross loss ratio will vary over time within this target range of between 60 and 70 percent. And while it is likely that our gross loss ratio may occasionally move above this average, in periods with notably severe weather, for example, we expect our average gross loss ratio to remain in the 60s. In any event, due to comprehensive reinsurance, our net loss ratio, and hence our unit economics, is most unlikely to change much, quarter to quarter or even year to year. Operating expenses, excluding loss and loss adjustment expense, increased fairly modestly in Q2 as compared to the prior year, with sales and marketing expense actually lower in Q2 this year due to continued strong improvement in our marketing efficiency. Our marketing spend in Q2 generated more than twice the sales as compared to a year ago in terms of the amount of customer premium acquired. We also continued to hire new Lemonade team members in all areas of the company in support of customer and premium growth and thus saw increases in each of the other expense lines. Also to note, certain G&A expenses increased as we continue to prepare for life as a public company. And we expect those expenses to continue to increase in the coming quarters as we enter our first full year as a public company. These expenses include, among others, D&O insurance premiums, which have increased significantly for most newly public companies in recent quarters. I note that the timing of certain expenses particularly marketing spend and new higher payroll expense, in the second quarter was influenced by the onset of the pandemic, with significant belt tightening in April and early May. We began to reverse this approach in the second half of Q2 as we gained more visibility into the impact on our business. We began to revert to prior growth spend and hiring patterns by early June and expect that theme to continue into the second half of the year and likewise to influence our investment strategy as well as our financial expectations. Our net loss in the quarter was $21 million as compared to $23.1 million in the second quarter of 2019, and our adjusted EBITDA loss was $18.2 million in Q2, an improvement as compared to $23 million of loss in the second quarter of 2019. Our cash, cash equivalents, and total investments balance ended the quarter at $295.4 million, reflecting the use of cash for operations of approximately $35.5 million since year-end 2019. And the recent closing of our initial public offering in early July brought us additional net proceeds of approximately $335 million. We had 381 employees as of June 30, and we'll increase that number over the coming quarters. We've resumed our normal hiring pace after a brief pause during the early weeks of the pandemic. We've since hired dozens of new employees and have become quite adept at remote onboarding. We continue to have the vast majority of our global workforce working remotely. And in April, we launched our second European territory early in the pandemic with a 100% remote workforce with great vigor and efficiency. Our progress in the first half of the year is influencing our investment approach for the second half. With continued steady growth and strong marketing efficiency, we've resumed a bullish stance on both growth and hiring. We plan to redeploy savings generated during early Q2 into the second half of the year and increase somewhat beyond. While our full year expense plan and EBITDA loss expectations are relatively unchanged, the timing has shifted such that we plan to invest more in the second half, which will offset the savings in the second quarter and we expect will set us up nicely for continued growth into 2021 and beyond. It's worth taking a moment to review that our model differs from traditional broker-based insurance incumbent in a number of ways. One is that we expense the vast majority of our customer acquisition expense up front at inception, while we earn back the return on that investment over the life of the customer. And this is in contrast to many insurance companies that incur ongoing commission expense for customer acquisition at a much lower initial rate, but typically for the life of the customer. And this is another key reason that we measure and report in-force premium, which gives some additional insight into what we are acquiring when we invest in growth. A customer acquired in Q2, for example, drove significant acquisition investment in the quarter, but on a gap basis, very little incremental earnings. Enforced premium captures more fully the top-line impact of this growth investment. And with these goals and metrics in mind, I'll outline our specific financial expectations for the third quarter and for the full year of 2020. For the third quarter, we expect enforced premium as of September 30 of between 170 and $175 million, 
We expect gross earned premium of $37 to $39 million, gap revenue of between $14 and $15 million, and an adjusted EBITDA loss of between $32 and $33 million. We expect stock-based compensation expense of approximately $3 million and capital expenditures of approximately $1 million. And as Daniel noted, we should uh, reiterate that gap revenue will change from roughly $30 million in Q2 to between $14 and $15 million uh, as guided in Q3, and this is as expected. And it's related to the implementation of our new proportional reinsurance structure as of July 1, 2020. The gap accounting rules are such that seeded premiums are excluded from gap revenue. And accordingly, we publish enforced premium and gross earned premium as helpful metrics that capture the overall growth trajectory of the business before the impact of reinsurance. For the full year of 2020, we expect the following. Enforced premium at December 31st of between $190 and $195 million. Gross earned premium of $147 to $151 million. Gap revenue of between $86 and $88 million an adjusted EBITDA loss of between $106 and $109 million, stock-based compensation expense for the full year of approximately $11 million, and capital expenditures of approximately $4 million for the full year. Thanks so much for joining our first quarterly review as a public company. We are grateful for your interest and for your support. And with that, we'll now turn the call back over to the operator, who can hopefully rejoin the call with Q&A instructions, and we'll be happy to take questions. Certainly. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Michael Phillips with Morgan Stanley, your line is open. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, first question, uh, you know, you, you talked about how you didn't see much impact from furlough stay-at-home on top-line metrics. Um, not that many customers asked for, <clears throat> asked for expensive payments, and all that was good. Um, I guess, did you see any impact on the loss side? Whether was, was there a pause in claim activity for the first, maybe first month or so of, of the furlough? Anything on that side that impacted that 67 percent uh, growth loss ratio? Yeah. Hey, Mike. Thanks. Um, the, the short answer is yes, but fairly modest. Um, so we we did see some dynamics, particularly in the earlier part of the quarter, as people really readjusted their behaviors and it was sort of a shock to everyone's system. We did see things kind of quiet down pretty pretty quickly um, and then it normalized a bit. So I would say there's a modest um, tailwind in the loss ratio for the quarter due to the pandemic. Uh, nothing dramatic, but I would say more slightly more favorable than unfavorable. Things are starting to normalize a bit more now, um, but I would I would expect the the trends we're seeing at the end of the quarter of Q2 to, to persist, uh, you know, at a fairly stable rate for some time. Okay, thanks. Um, you, you, you both, uh, yourself and Dan, talked about, um, you know, on the premium for policy, how it shifted up because of the mix shift, and, and that's kind of been a trend that's kind of been happening for a while. And then uh, Dan said, uh, you know, the homeowner from under the homeowner kind of graduation was a trend that, that continued on a bit in the quarter. Is there anything you can give us in terms of metrics around that that we can that we can see or, or, or from you guys that talks about specifically um, those numbers of the shift between renters and homeowners? Yeah, so uh, we, we don't give a, a, a deep breakdown of those metrics, um, but it obviously is something we track pretty closely internally. Um, the, the themes, I think, that we... Uh, have shared over the past couple of quarters have continued. So we're continuing to see more new customers at a pretty stable ratio come in the form of homeowners. And if you look at the premium per customer over the past several quarters, you know, continuing into Q2 and into our guidance, we expect that trend to continue. We do have some control over the homeowners uh, proportion of the business because we, um, you know, are somewhat more cautious as we build a book of business, as we move into homeowners, but all systems are, are, are pretty much go. And so we're focused on increasing the proportion of homeowners over time. Uh, we expect that to start to look more like the market over the longer term. You know, today it's obviously skewed more to renters than to homeowners. But in the U.S., as you know, the business is uh, the vast majority of homeowners. So over time we'll continue to move that direction. It's also probably worth um, reminding that we're seeing some 
increase from our existing customers, regardless of whether they graduate to condo or homeowners. So our average renter, for example, um, pays us more in year one and year two and year three uh, than they did when they first start, and that's a trend we've continued to see. So I think the, the premium per customer will continue to grow. Um, we don't guide to it specifically, but we, we see those trends continuing, and I, I, I think you can expect to see um, let's give you more color on that in the coming couple quarters. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Uh, last one, and then uh, maybe if we can recue, I guess. Um, it, it, maybe it's not a, a fair quarter to talk about this. I'm, I'm not sure I'll, I'll let you guys decide on your answer. Um, uh, because of what you did with pullback in the marketing spend, but you did mention that you, you're still getting more premium per dollar of marketing spend than you have before. Um, but we, we've also talked a lot about kind of the LTV to CAC expense and how that ratio has trended up over time. Is it fair to comment on that, given the pullback, or is it too distorted because of the pullback in marketing spend, or anything you can talk about about, you know, kind of that, that LTV to CAC ratio and how that looked this quarter versus prior quarters? Yeah, I would I would think of the LTV to CAC dynamics as strong and stable, and and the trend that we had seen for the last uh, few quarters is continuing improvement, and so. Um, the, those trends, I think, will continue. With regard to our spend, that, that sort of a different dynamic. So when when we noted that we pulled back a little bit in the early part of the quarter, that literally just spending fewer dollars, but did not really impact the unit economics. There were just fewer units, and then we kind of resumed the normal spending pace as we got towards the middle of the second half of the quarter and are really back to where we originally expected to be, and in most cases somewhat ahead. So stronger uh, marketing economics, um, very strong feel in terms of how we think the second half of the year is shaping up in, in terms of our ability to spend um, growth investment wisely and, and get the return we expect. It's a little early to say that there – I think it's not fair to say, yeah, there's a dramatic shift in LTV to CAC. Those dynamics tend to evolve – you know, more, more gradually over time, but, but what we're seeing is, is stable and, and positive. Okay, thanks, Tim. I will uh, pause and hop back in if I can later. Thanks very much. Ron Josie with JMP Securities. Your line is open. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Appreciate it. I just wanted maybe Daniel and Tim talk a little more about guidance, um, particularly with your commentary in the letter around, you know, three QBs being seasonally the strongest in the quarter. There remains unknowns around school closing and moves and whatever. However, it seems, you know, per the commentary and the guidance, nothing really materialized in April. So can you help us unpack a little bit more your guidance as it appears, you know, a little bit lower expectations in the quarter didn't really materialize in 2Q. And so maybe any insights on what you're seeing in July and August and, and the assumptions and guidance would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. So uh, two different dynamics. You know, Q, Q2 was really driven by us and our reaction to uh, the high level of uncertainty that everyone is feeling, you know, March, uh, April, maybe early May. And so we proactively made those decisions in terms of what we would spend and when. And, and uh, as things strengthened, we, we ramped that back up. And during that period, we're pretty cautiously watching the other KPIs, what's happening with churn, what's happening with payments, what's happening with just general customer behavior. And as the days and weeks went by, there was just not much changing, uh, which is always uh, good news in terms of how we think about uh, deploying more dollars. And so when we um, laid out our thoughts and, and expectations for the second half of the year, the decisions that we control and that we manage, we decided to take – take that savings from Q2, if you want to term it as savings, money that was unspent in the early part of the quarter, and invest that in the second half because we are seeing the return. We are finding ways to deploy those dollars, and it's working. The uncertain part is the part we don't control, which is the historical seasonal trend, which if you look at the past two years, maybe even maybe even three years, it's been a pretty um, – uh, a pretty discreet or visible step change with Q3 higher, Q4 lower, and really driven by the, the moving dynamic of, of people in the U.S., and that's just uncertain this year. Um, we're, we're confident that we can deliver the numbers uh, over the course of the year. It may be that there's some shift among months um, between August, September, October versus prior years, and I think we've built in you know enough conservatism into our guidance such that um, if we see what we expect to see, which is a little different versus prior years, we'll, we'll be in good shape. If it's, 
uh, dramatically different, then, then that's something we'll have to to um, react to, but so far we're not seeing anything that's too dramatically different than, than prior years. But we want to be cautious. That's super helpful. Thank you, Tim. Ross Sandler with Barclays. Your line is open. Uh, hey, Tim. Just wanted to follow up on the uh, the customer acquisition uh, conversation from from a couple of questions ago. So we've seen, you know, across the digital advertising industry that CPMs have come down pretty markedly. Uh, through through the COVID impact, and you guys have seen fairly dramatic improvement in your you know unit cost uh, of acquiring a customer even before COVID. So you know with those two dynamics in place, and and, and the increased efficiency, um, you know, and, and the fact that you're now leaning back in in June, when do you expect uh, the customer growth rate or the Grocer and premium growth rates to, to ramp back up. And then, you know, related to that, the retention rate that you guys disclosed in the S1 of around, you know, 65% or so uh, is pretty good, but it leaves some room for improvement. So what are the biggest drivers of churn and what are you doing to, to drive up that retention rate? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ross. Um, so uh, a couple thoughts in terms of the first question and customer Ramp, our, our um, the relationship between our spend and, and customer acquisitions is pretty linear. So when we turn things up, you know, you, you see it right away. You know, it's almost a, a real time. You know, uh, in the day or in the week that you uh, change how we invest, what channels we use, how, how many dollars we're putting forth, and so what we're seeing and what we're spending today, we're, we're getting reaction to that, and so that's factored into how we see the second half playing out in terms of both uh, customer acquisition and premium acquisition. Worth noting that while we, we certainly track um, and report the number of customers and the premium, if you, if you had to pick one that we think is more important, it's really the, the premium. Um, you know, a, a renter customer is a great customer and we'll keep them for as, as long as we can, hopefully for a lifetime and, and they'll graduate and drive more value. But if we can acquire a, a customer as a homeowner um, efficiently and effectively, we'll, we'll we'll do that too. And so, the reason we guide to top line in terms of enforced premium and not to customers for that very reason is is we and our growth team are really optimizing for premium. And sometimes the customer count can vary a little bit, um, but we expect to see uh, obviously growth in in both of those. Uh, we also expect um, the premium per customer to continue to grow, just to the the underlying dynamics of um, the trends we've seen and the, the continued mix shift toward homeowners. Um, in terms of churn, and I don't know, maybe uh, Daniel can can chime in a little bit. You know, this is something obviously there's there's kind of long term and short term. Short term, we've been very focused on what is new and what has changed. You know, what's COVID driven, what's behavior driven, um, what's unique across product lines. Um, between renters and homeowners, and from a from a, a short-term perspective, a, a pandemic perspective, again, we're not seeing uh, much dramatic at all. Um, we've allowed customers to defer payments. Not much uh, really happened there. Um, we're tracking churn very carefully. Not much has really changed. In terms of the longer term, what we're doing is what we plan to do, which is um, maintain a, an extraordinarily high NPS so that we can retain customers for as long uh, as possible, hopefully a, a lifetime. We've launched a new product. So for the first time, we have pet insurance, uh, which is a new coverage type. Uh, for the first time, a lemonade customer can have two different policy types and take advantage of bundling and, and bundling discounts. And that's something, obviously, that's been on our you know plan for a very long time, but now it's actually in the market. And so I think our theme on churn is keep doing exactly what we're doing, um, hit the plans and goals that we set out, um, and that includes new coverage types, great customer support, um, and then you know as we get better color on that, we'll, we'll certainly share it. Um, I don't know if Daniel had any other uh, thoughts on other churn or uh, customers in general. Um, thanks, um, hey Ross. Yeah, just a, a couple of um, added color points on, on churn. So. Um, there is reason to believe that churn will continue to improve. Um, so first is just the aging of our cohorts. The worst year in terms of retention across the industry, frankly, is year one. Um, and given the growth rates that we're experiencing, a very large portion of our customers are first-year customers. So a big portion of our business is, from a retention perspective, in the worst category 
um, just in terms of the aging of the cohorts. And indeed, even within the year, we see the, you know, the worst couple of months of churn or the first couple of months of the policy. And as you add months and years um, to a cohort, the retention numbers start improving pretty significantly. Um, beyond that, I would say that um, the different products that we have have very different churn dynamics as well, or retention dynamics. So renters tend to be younger consumers and more transient. Um, they go to college, they come back, they move in with their boyfriend, with their girlfriend, they move back home, all those kinds of changes. Um, and they also move from state to state, and oftentimes they move into a state where we're not yet launched. So all of those reasons are just a part of the, the nature of the stage of life of those customers. Um, Tim alluded earlier to the growing portion of homeowners in our book. That, too, helps because our retention numbers among homeowners is uh, significantly higher. Um, as we launch more territories, I mentioned that in passing, but also new products like PET, um, we are able to cater to our customers more fully, um, and that in addition to everything else that I spoke about, militates in favor of uh, higher retention levels over time. Um, but having said all of that, I'd love to add a different gloss on the whole story. So when you think about um, customers leaving or churn or, or retention, um, I, I think it's fair to categorize it in one of two broad strokes, um, um, one of two broad strokes. So, you think about people who leave their cable company to go to Netflix. When they cut that cable, um, they're never going back. That is churn. They have left cable. They've now discovered a new way of consuming media, and that is not a change that's going to be reversed anytime soon. And when somebody leaves Netflix because they're traveling in Europe or they have just moved in with their boyfriend or girlfriend and they're sharing accounts or any of those dynamics, they remain kind of alumni, right? They're still ambassadors of goodwill. They love the company. And they will return. I know I myself have had occasion to leave Netflix on two or three different occasions and I'm back to being a Netflix consumer. And I, I think if you think about those two paradigms, um, Lemonade falls squarely into the latter. So when we do see customers leaving, more often than not, they leave with a love note. <laughs> quite literally, when they leave, we ask them for comment about why they're leaving. We get quite a lot of data on that. And oftentimes it's accompanied by, hey, I love you guys, but... I'm moving in with my girlfriend, I'm moving to the state, I'm moving to college or what have you. And just to put some numbers behind that, if I look at our churn, <coughs> excuse me, um, we do seldom, but we do sometimes get customers that are unhappy with the service and they give that as a reason for churning. But they are outnumbered 11 to 1 by people saying, hey, I'm moving in with my family and that's why I'm, I'm canceling. Um, we pride ourselves on giving uh, a really exceptional claims experience, but on occasion customers feel hard done by in terms of claims, and they can say that that's why they're leaving. But those people are outnumbered 36 to 1, literally 36 to 1, by people who say, I'll be back. So I, I hope all of that gives you both a sense about why you think that churn rates are going to improve um, for structural reasons, but also why those people who are leaving us, I think, will come back as circumstances in their life change and they have need for insurance once more. Ralph Shackard with William Blair. Your line is open. Uh, excuse me. Good morning. I um, wanted to kind of talk about uh, the customer conversation again. Um, the ads were much stronger than our model, but Tim, I know you talked about some holdback in advertising. And uh, while I know you optimize for policy, just kind of wanted to understand that dynamic, uh, maybe some perspective of the drivers of customer growth in the quarter, what did the cadence look like throughout the quarter, and you know, maybe some trends post-quarter on the customer growth side. Sure. So, I, you know, there's a couple different um, levers we're pulling, and, then, and there's, a, there's um, different dynamics. It all kind of comes together and looks a little simplistic when you just look at the, the number of customers added in the quarter. And so if I, if I pull those apart a little bit, uh, I would think about um, timing trends, uh, product trends, and spending trends. So from a timing perspective, I think we've kind of covered that. We, you know, end of, end of March, early April, April sat down and said, we really don't know what Q2 looks like in the world, uh, certainly, and, and to some extent, Lemonade. Uh, and so we were just very cautious. Um, we didn't go to zero. You never want to kind of cut growth spend to zero 
um, because it just takes quite a while to ramp anything back up. But we, we pared back fairly significantly and gathered more data. From a mix perspective, we tend to optimize, just period, we tend to optimize. And so some days, some campaigns, um, things are stronger with higher return on renters, and some days it's homeowners, and some channels are particularly suited to one or the other. And so there tends to be an ebb and flow overall. If you looked at, say, a week or a month, we see a relatively consistent um, proportion of the business that's homeowners. But that kind of hides what's going on under the covers, which is we've got a lot of states to play with. We've got a lot of campaigns to play with, and we've got a growth team that really, uh, you know, spends 24 hours a day thinking about how to maximize the return on those dollars. Uh, and, it, and it is working. If you look at a year ago uh, versus today, you know, more than um, twice as many dollars are coming in for every dollar that we spend. Um, in terms of you know, how we see that playing forward. Again, I, I think the seasonality is a little bit of a wild card, but I, I got to tell you, the, you know, the sessions we have with the team thinking about how to deploy dollars, um, the, challenge, the challenge is not where can we spend, the challenge is how much can we spend because we're seeing really strong returns. And so we're trying to, you know, balance the spend with the overall health of the business. We don't want our NPS scores to suffer. We don't want... Um, you know, really terrific progress on our loss ratio to change radically. It can vary a little bit, but we don't want to um, alter things that are performing really well by, um, you know, seeking growth at all costs. But the, the, the dynamic re really is that we are finding ways to spend dollars uh, at, a, at a very strong return. And it doesn't seem like it's dramatically sort of pandemic driven. Like it's a continuation of themes we saw over the past several months in the past few quarters, as opposed to a, a step change that we saw in, in April or May. So we're, we're really encouraged by the combination of all three of these and how that growth team is, is really performing. That's helpful, Tim. Maybe uh, one more. Uh, you talked about how uh, the business emerges stronger coming out of the pandemic. Just maybe some perspective and how it emerges stronger uh, a little bit more color there, and perhaps so, uh, the long-term impacts for the business. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, you know, we're seeing what, what a lot of, um, you know, tech or digital companies are seeing, which is themes and trends we saw are amplified or accelerated, or you know, another way, another way to put it is, you know, changes we expected to happen over a year or two are happening over, over a month or two. Um, we're seeing the same, and we're feeling the same. Uh, folks who want to, uh, you know, at the age of 20 or 30, go sit down in a, an insurance agent's office were dwindling before the pandemic. Uh, and, and certainly during the pandemic, that's gone to probably close to zero in many cases. These, these trends are, are, are probably not ever going to go back to where they were. And so we are, you know, while we're not taking it as a given, we expect this acceleration to, con to continue uh, and to really be right in our wheelhouse. You know, we were uh, we we had the entire company able to work from home before the pandemic. We didn't do it too frequently, although uh, probably each person had done it from time to time. Departments had tested it, so we were you know within a few days of work from home, it was just business as usual. Um, we were able to uh, you know launch an entire new European country in April with 100% remote folks with you know terrific results, zero customer awareness, but anything was uh, different than it would otherwise have been. You know, we're thinking carefully about how we deploy employees and where offices are and all those things that other companies are, are thinking about. But we really feel we have um, pretty dramatic degrees of freedom based on how the company was built. You know, one system from a digital substrate designed to do just this. We didn't know, obviously, a, a pandemic was going to come and accelerate all this stuff, but the, the business was really designed for this. Great. That's helpful. Thanks, Tim. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Frank with Opco. Your line is open. Hey, it's Jason Halstein. Um, should not have spelled my last name for the operator. Um, so two questions. Maybe talk a bit more about the outlook for the third quarter and the back half. Just given the second quarter beat versus your expectations, is, did you see any, any pull forward into the second quarter that, um, you know, maybe, you know, th that you're then kind of compensating for in the outlook? And then... The main question that we get from clients is just the concept around bundling, given how important it generally is for the industry. 
Um, and mostly people focus on the importance of automotive insurance bundling. Um, clearly, you know, you've hit, you have targeted a, you know, more millennial customer. Um, I think automotive ownership generally is lower amongst that group, and we can kind of think about, you know, what the secular trends are for automotive ownership. Just talk broadly how you're thinking about bundling. Um, obviously, you're launching PET. It, you know, if things like auto are important, um, how do you check that box? Are you thinking about maybe partnering with auto insurance companies, or is that just something that you may have to launch on your own over time? Thank you. Sure. So um, I'll take the first one, and then uh, maybe if uh, Daniel have any thoughts on sort of the overall product strategy, um, maybe take that one second. So from a, a pull forward um, uh, question, the, the way you phrase it, it's an interesting one. We, we kind of thought that through, and, you know, what, what are we doing? Are we getting customers in, in advance uh, that we would have gotten otherwise? Uh, the way we kind of thought about it is, number one, obviously just great results and, and good returns and, and ramping up spend was working, so that was step one. Step two is we had always planned and expected that things would return to a more normalized growth pattern in 2021 and, and beyond, regardless of, you know, kind of where we are now in the, in the pandemic. And so we have ambitious goals and expectations for 20, 2021 and beyond. And so I think our increase in spend and our increase in our expectations for our enforced premium for the second half is really just setting us up for a, a, a higher, um, you know, base or foundation going into 2021. So rather than I would think of it less as, you know, our, our Q3 approach, our Q4 approach, our Q1 approach, and more of a long-term growth approach. And we can power through, you know, the, the you know, a little bit of uncertainty on seasonality. And, you know, we're, we're expecting and planning that, that Q4 can be strong. Um, now, can it be as strong as Q3? I think it's possible. Historically, it, it's been a, a lighter quarter in Q3, but we're ready – uh, and, and built into our expectations, our guidance, an ability to invest more. Um, and we'll, you know, obviously continue to manage and monitor that. Um, but we're thinking, I think, more about 2021 at this point uh, and, and launching with a great foundation than we are worried as much about, you know, what's happening in uh, August or September. Um, and just a couple of thoughts about the, the bundling question. Um, so... We do think about our customers um, as being rather unusual in the insurance landscape. So we attract customers um, surprisingly young. Um, about 90% of our customers, as best we can tell, are joining us at a time that they've never been to another insurance company. So rather than playing the I switched and I saved game upon which the entire industry is really predicated, we find ourselves playing a different sport where we're acquiring customers before the traditional insurance companies have got to them, and, and typically at a time that they don't particularly want them because um, the, the pre total premiums are relatively modest earlier in life. And then as we um, delight them and uh, continue to get uh, and kind of number one ratings in terms of uh, the comparison sites or NPS in the 70s and 80s, um, we hope to retain them for life as they go through predictable life cycle events, and car insurance or, or buying a car would, would certainly be one of those in the fullness of time. Um, but, but it is important for me to stress kind of the, the underlying, the core element of, of our philosophy of acquiring customers at a time that we're competing with non-consumption, delighting them, and then growing with them. Um, as somebody said to me when I kind of analyzed our, our business, he said to me, um, you're signing LeBron James in eighth grade. So it's that kind of a dynamic of a, a competing with non-consumption, acquiring fabulous customers, and then growing with them. And our step towards pet insurance, which we uh, launched just a few weeks ago, is part of exactly that. The majority of our customers are pet parents. This is a, a woefully under-addressed market. The premiums for pet insurance are very substantial. They're equivalent to condo insurance pretty much. Um, so that is our first step, our first foray outside of homeowners in order to flesh out the offering and the prioritization of our products is really born of our customer centricity. So we think about our customer, place her at the center, say, okay, what are the needs? There's renters, and she'll graduate to a condo, then she'll graduate to a homeowner, in addition she'll get you know, the, 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 the dog, the cat, perhaps the diamond ring, and yes, in the fullness of time, she'll need all the, these other insurance products, and we hope to be there for her. 
So without talking about car insurance specifically, I, I think that the fact that we don't yet have all of our uh, products out there is a handicap. Um, other, uh, other insurance companies will offer a more complete list of products than we have, and the fact that we're managing to grow at over 100% year-on-year, notwithstanding the fact that we haven't yet fully fleshed it out, I think is encouraging because it means that there's a lot of opportunity for us to grow further and uh, improve retention rates, improve LTV, improve everything else as good as it, as it is now as we offer new products. Presumably, it will get better. Um, one of our early investors is Google, and this information is a little bit out of date, but just to give you a sense of this, they told us a while ago that they're seeing and the same volume of searches for lemonade car insurance or auto insurance as they were seeing for lemonade home insurance. So we don't feel like there's any lack of demand out there for lemonade, and our, our entire systems, our brand, um, our technology, our licenses, were all built with extensibility in mind to be able to launch more products with pretty, pretty rapid succession. And I think what you saw um, three weeks ago with pet insurance is a sign of things to come. Thank you. Keith Terry with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to dig in a little bit more in a, in a couple of areas. On the, the homeowner's graduation that you've, that you've talked about, uh, I'm curious if you can even even just sort of qualify for us a little bit more how much of the, the growth in homeowners you're seeing are, are, is coming from existing rental customers um, graduating, uh, as we've talked about, versus you know completely new homeowners being attracted to um, to the platform by the marketing work that that, that you're doing, um, and then um, you know one of the big narratives around you know the last quarter and just the um, uh, the environment is this this migration of uh, younger um, urban um, uh, single people um, professionals back to their you know back to their you know suburban homes with their with their with their parents as part of this. Um, that certainly didn't seem to show up in, in your numbers, and I'm just curious what part of that narrative you think might be wrong, and then a couple other follow-up questions as well. Sure. So a couple thoughts there, and then and jump in, Daniel, if you like. Um, in terms of the proportion of homeowner acquisition, the, we're seeing a, con, a continued trend. So historically, most, may, most recent quarters, the majority of homeowners uh, that we're adding are, are uh, new customers that we're going out and, and acquiring, um, direct new ads. Uh, but we've had a consistent theme of existing renters either buying a condo or, or buying a home and, and moving up, but the majority are still direct acquisition. And the one, you know, direct, obviously, we manage and, and direct proactively, and the other tends to be just driven by life events. Um, Interestingly enough, I think there could be as much in the current environment, pandemic-driven, that could cause there to be more uh, relocation or more home ownership or more um, decisions made about where people live and their long-term commitment to those places. It's a little early, and the data is very light to be able to say that for sure, um, but that is something where we could actually see uh, more of those decisions that drive graduation being made as opposed to less. So I think part of what you're not seeing in Q2 is is that, um, you know, for everybody who moves uh, home, somebody's moving elsewhere to a new location because they're, they're tired of the city and they're renting a new apartment on their own, and, and that uh, may require insurance. So I think it's a, I think it's a mix. Um, we'll continue to proactively acquire homeowners, you know, directly, um, and then we're, of course, doing what we – everything we can to – ensure that when our customers face those life decisions, when they're ready to move, when they're ready to buy the first home, uh, when they need more coverage, um, we'll be there. You know, we're there with PET now, and we'll look to add others over time. Um, that, that, that's how I would think about it. Great. No, that's, that's really helpful. When you, when you look at the, um, the improvement, significant improvement that was made in uh, the gross, gross, gross loss ratio this, this, this quarter, could you help us by disaggregating sort of the components of that? How much of that was um, uh, higher denial rates on claims, uh, higher premiums um, being or just fewer claims coming in? I know you sort of addressed a little bit of that um, that, that earlier. Or was there something else that, that contributed that, um, 
uh, that maybe we're not thinking about? So I, I would think of it as a continuation of, of prior trends um, with some benefit from the pandemic. And we're not, we don't, uh, we're not specifically quantifying it, but I would think of it as nominal. Um, certainly helped a little bit. It didn't, didn't hurt in terms of that progression from you know, 72 percent the prior quarter, you know, five points of improvement. We have seen that in, in several prior quarters. The most recent prior quarter was, was actually the anomaly where the improvement was only only 1 percent. So um, I would say the impact uh, from changing claim behavior or denial of claims is probably zero. Um, we, our practice is unchanged, and it's, it's I would categorize as extremely customer friendly, uh, but within reason. You know, we are very good at detecting fraud. We are very good at detecting uh, claims that are are not appropriate, and it's really part of our business model. It's part of our uh, behavioral analytics approach to, to business, but that was unchanged uh, essentially in the quarter, and that's something that's very really important to us. So I, I would think of it as you know very nominal tailwinds, um, and we're in the range now. So if, if we think about you know one of the things we noted, and I think it's important to, to, to dwell on a bit, is we're in the target range. 60 to 70 percent is uh, better than industry average. Uh, Gross loss ratio, you know, you don't want it to go to zero uh, and you don't want it to de decline forever because that means something's wrong with your business. You're giving up growth. Um, there's other opportunities you're not taking advantage of. But in that 60 to 70 percent range, we think there's very strong performance. Um, it, it will vary as we build the book, as we launch new products, as we launch new geos. But we don't expect it to vary dramatically uh, outside of that range. So I would think of it as we're, we're kind of at that target within a few percentage points. Great, no, that's, that's really helpful. Sorry, Heath, I, I just had no, no, like two brief comments. Yeah, Please. I just wanted to um, build on what um, Tim said as well. So this isn't, um, as Tim said, this isn't about the pandemic. This is our 10th consecutive quarter of declining loss ratio. So this is really something um, that has been a very strong trend. We've, we've halved our loss ratio over the course of the last two years. So this is something systemic. Um, one thing to point out is it's not price. Um, while we have implemented some price changes recently, it takes a while to earn into that. And I think it would be fair to um, round that down to zero in terms of how much of a loss ratio is a fact of, of price changes, which is pretty striking because most companies that improve their loss ratio will do it by raising prices, and that's really not what's going on here. Um, we, we do have a, a sense, uh, I think this is one that is um, being appreciated in, in this in industry recent, in recent years all the more, but that you're really not in the business of underwriting or ensuring property so much as people, and you really want to get into a sense of um, understanding what kind of risks people represent. And there it comes back to the fundamentals of Lemonade, um, acquiring about 100 times more data than broker-based businesses, and then having a closed-loop system that can use those data in ways that are unavailable to uh, more traditional incumbents. So using that data in terms of who you target in a marketing campaign, how you're on board, how you handle claims, customer support inquiries, and having that single uh, vantage point, which is customer-centric, so that data that you've collected in any one interaction can inform every other interaction. And I think really if you want to look um, and, and ask what is the fundamental propellant of our, uh, of our um, precipitous and steady decline in loss ratio, it is exactly that. It is that digital infrastructure and the AI that was implemented and, and how that uh, um, creates a closed-loop system that reinforces itself with every turn of the flywheel, if you like. And the other thing I'd just say is that um, you know this, of course, but loss ratios are lagging indicators, um, changes that you take today in terms of any of your practices, pricing, like we discussed, or underwriting or anything else, um, will take time to flow through to earn into the book. Um, and in addition to, to that being generically true, I go back to a comment I made earlier about churn, which is that loss ratios of first-year cohorts are historically worse than second-year cohorts and third-year cohorts, and that is true at an industry-wide level as well. So maturing cohorts also give us and some, some wind in our sail. So these have been steady progressions and structural reasons uh, that have driven the, the loss ratio. And the, the final thing I'd say at the risk of uh, um, um, saying too much here, but um, that loss ratio decline, that, that steady decline over the course of years now, um, has been 
all the more extraordinary, not merely because it has been so sustained and, and so dramatic, but that it has come at a time of over 400% compounded annual growth rate. And that really does fly in the face of insurance orthodoxy, which preaches that you can't grow fast and get better dramatically concurrently. The two are live in tension with one with each other. And I think that makes sense when you're a broker-based business, you know, human uh, intensive, because rapid growth can overwhelm humans. Too much data leads to people cutting corners and, and being overwhelmed. Of course, when you're built on an AI um, infrastructure, it's the other way around. Those torrents of data don't um, inhibit the improved performance and, and getting smarter. They are the precondition to it. So hopefully that all um, helps you understand the, the loss ratio. No, that does, and it, it's really helpful. And then if I, if I just may, a quick one on, on Pat. Um, what what allowed the company to, to lower the entry-level price for, for pet insurance? I, I seem to recall when you announced the product last month, it was $12, and then you noted in yesterday's release and on the call today that it was, had gone down to 10 <clears throat> And then also just curious, you know, what, if any, impact the bundling discount offer for pet um, could have on the, uh, on the loss ratio. And then I'm done, I promise. Maybe I'll, I'll kick it off and then Tim um, uh, come in with, with some more. I, I'll say two or three things. Um, Heath. The first one is that um, while our expense ratio today looks high um, because we're spending a lot on customer acquisition, the fundamentals of our business actually lead to a very light marginal cost to serve. Um, the, the biggest and, and best and, and, um, and, and most efficient insurance companies in America have about a ratio of one uh, 400 customers to one employee so it's about a 400 to one ratio and even among the top five that drops off pretty quickly and you get to like 150 to one and lemonade is over 2000 to one so the, the digital infrastructure that we just spoke about in terms of helping with loss ratio certainly helps with expense ratio in terms of automation uh, streamlining if you're paying your claims and um, a third of them without any human intervention at all and you're onboarding customers pretty much 100 percent of them algorithmically um, you can understand how that will translate into an ability to price more uh, aggressively. And indeed, the same is true with our renters in trance, right? Um, Entry-level buyers of renters in trance from Lemonade will typically see something in the order of 50%, 50% savings compared to incumbents. And in the early days, people um, said, oh, we're, we're selling dollars for 90 cents. We're, we're selling at a loss that's unsustainable. But I think our loss ratio at 67% shows that that's not the case, that we're able to drive efficiencies and do things at a cost point, at, at a price point and a cost structure that is unfamiliar to industry at large. So a lot of that, I think, spills over just as it did in renters. It will spill over to, to pageant trends. But the one other thing that I wanted to say is we are experimentalists, um, and we do see new products that we launch and new geographies that we launch. We may have um, unattractive loss ratios in the early days. Um, and that's the tuition fee that we pay now. Thankfully, um, it's not like uh, September 2016 when we launched our initial product because then we had no denominator and every, all our tuition was, um, uh, all, our, the, you know, all of our business was, was the tuition. Today, we've got a very sizable business and growing fast. Um, so I don't think you'll see PET or other new products hit it, even if we got the pricing wrong. But my point is, we're okay with launching new products using our best data, best guess, um, you know, with smart people doing best work, but also understanding that until we've generated the kind of data sets that we need, there will be some, some errors, and we will improve pretty quickly after that. And we tend to think about um, the first year of new products of the year where we want to onboard as many customers as possible in order to generate those data sets and then in the second year to start implementing all the learnings and really to hit our target loss ratio in the third year. And you've seen that with renters, we're seeing that in homeowners, and it wouldn't be a shock to me if we saw something similar with PET as well. Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. Jerome Kinner with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Um, he, he asked my questions, but um, I will follow up on, on PET and maybe try to understand what impact the bundling of PET and, um, and renters could have on the loss ratio, considering the, the 10% discount you're offering. Yeah, so I, 
I would, I would say it's a little too early to say. I wouldn't expect it to be dramatic. Um, so our you know, the, the, the trends we've seen and the fact that we're in the target range is um, something that we expect to continue. Um, we'll obviously uh, get better data as we go. Um, the response to PET has actually been, you know, quite quite positive, quite strong. Um, and I would think of, you know, maybe the whole business in aggregate and the way um, we think about, you know, expenses and, and losses and the, and the combined ratio aspect, which is more of a traditional insurance view, is we've got improvements coming everywhere. And so to the extent we're managing and growing the business, we've got more than just the loss ratio lever to pull. Um, but I wouldn't expect it to, to cause, you know, dramatic shifts. Um, generally, um, people who have more than one type of policy are better risks. Um, they have more coverage. They're thinking more thoughtfully about what they protect. And so there's, you know, again, as with much of our business, there's as uh, for every potential negative impact, there's likely one or more likely positive impacts. And I think we see that in bundling. We see that with PET, and it's something we see pretty consistently across the whole business. Got it. Thank you. And then one last one on, on my end. Uh, when you talk about your loss ratios being better than industry average, is that for renters? specifically, or is that the industry average overall? Across I, all think there's a, I think there's an overall sort of PNC average that's in the low 70s range. That's where we were last quarter. And so I was just kind of generally referring to a, a pretty general um, market metric. Um, so it's not something we, you know, something we notice, but it's not something we manage ourselves by. Um, but it's notable that in just three years in the market, we're on par with, you know, billion-dollar large incumbents that have been around for decades. Got it. And do you have any sense where the renters industry average is on the loss ratio? Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna quote that. Uh, you, you can probably get a, a, as good a metric as I can give you and it's somewhat higher than the homeowners um, as it is for us. Um, but we're seeing continued improvement in both the renters uh, and the homeowners loss ratio over time. Okay. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to the Lemonade team for final remarks. Thanks, everyone, uh, for tuning in this morning from the entire Lemonade team. Uh, wishing you a uh, rest of a good morning. You can find the letter to shareholders uh, on our website at investor.lemonade.com, and we look forward to staying in touch. Have a great morning. This concludes the Lemonade second quarter 2020 earnings conference call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.